Uh, smash you over the head. Kick. Uh, oh, there goes the head. What? Can I be overly excited in a childish way about the fact that there's going to be a new King Kong vs. Godzilla movie? So until we wait for that day to approach in 2020, why don't we review the original King Kong vs. Godzilla. This movie came out in 1962, and once again is directed by Shiro Honda, who directed the first Godzilla movie. It's the first Godzilla movie to be written by Shinichi Segizawa, who would write many other Godzilla movies afterwards, and he wrote a couple of other science fiction movies for Toho before this movie, including the original Mothra. The score is once again done by Akira Fukube, and special effects are once again directed by Eiji Tsuburu. The movie focuses on a pharmaceutical company whose boss is not happy with the TV show that they're sponsoring. Basically, it's this low-grade, low-budget science TV show, which when you watch clips of it, it's pretty, pretty boring. At least if you have access to the Japanese version. So anyway, the head of the pharmaceutical company wants to boost the show's ratings and try to get a big sponsor. And what does he decide to do? Like any sane person would do, go to an island in the South Pacific, find the native's giant god, who happens to be a giant gorilla, kidnap him, and bring him to Tokyo. What could possibly go wrong from there? At the same time this is going on, an American submarine crashes into the very iceberg that trapped Godzilla seven years prior in Godzilla Raids Again. And so before you know it, Godzilla is free, he makes his way back to Japan, and it's only a matter of time before the two monsters eventually collide and face off against each other. Now when I reviewed all of the American Kong movies last year in prep for Skull Island, including the original Mighty Joe Young, I made a point to purposely skip over King Kong vs. Godzilla. The reason is because this is more of a Godzilla movie than it is a King Kong movie. It's a reboot of the Kong character, but it follows continuity with the end of Godzilla Raids again, where Godzilla was trapped in ice, and in this movie he breaks free of the iceberg. And I was planning ahead of time to review all the Godzilla movies again, so it would be really weird if I did this series of reviews, but I already reviewed King Kong vs. Godzilla. So that's why I totally skipped over this movie last year. But anyway, let's just get into this review. When I did my review for Godzilla Raids again yesterday, I said that both Godzilla and Kong, at least in their first couple of movies, are really intertwined. The first movie from each monster is a cinematic masterpiece. The second one is a rush sequel that has its good moments here and there, but you know it could have been a hell of a lot better if they didn't rush it. And the third one is not only the monster's first color movie and first widescreen movie, but it just so happens to be a crossover. And you might be wondering, how could a King Kong vs. Godzilla movie exist this soon? Both monsters are in their third movie. This is an idea that you normally do if you are completely out of ideas when it comes to a film franchise. That and taking your character into outer space. Well, there actually is a legit reason why this movie exists, but we'll get to that a little later. Let's talk about the movie itself. This is the first Godzilla movie in seven years, and within that seven year gap, Toho has been making and perfecting their craft of science fiction movies with stuff like Rodan, The Mysterians, Varen, Battle of Outer Space, Mothra, all of which I've already reviewed two years ago during my Toho month, so you can go check out those reviews. And it was only a matter of time before they brought back Godzilla, because it is their most popular creation. Unlike the first two movies, this one's very comedic. It has a very tongue-in-cheek quality about it, both within the human characters and all the stuff that you see with the monsters. That could either be a good thing or a bad thing, or both in this film's case. Let's talk about the good elements of the comedy first of all. All the stuff with the human characters is actually pretty funny, mainly from your two leads. The two actors in this movie play the employees that go out to Faroe Island to try to track down Kong and bring him to Japan and they have really good comedic timing, and their chemistry is really good. It's no wonder that they once again starred together in another Toho science fiction film, Atragon, which I've already reviewed. And a lot of the humor for me personally comes from some of their over-the-top reactions, because if there's anyone out there who can make really funny over-the-top reactions, it's the Japanese, just in terms of how they like yell or scream, or just the overall manic uh, body motions. <laughs> It's something you gotta watch for yourself. 
but the elements with your main characters in terms of the comedy, I actually thought worked well. And also it kind of helps that the plot is just downright absurd. A Japanese pharmaceutical company sends two employees to an island to bring a monster back to the mainland for advertising revenue, only for the monster to get loose and they don't experience any financial repercussions from it. They don't take any blame for it. They're not in trouble for it. That's just fucking stupid. The plot is just a method to get the two monsters to fight each other. But on the surface, there actually is a good idea about how corrupt corporations can be and they can go just go to absurd lengths just for greed. But I don't think it's really focused on that much. It is at the beginning, but once Kong reaches Japan and goes on the loose, it's kind of brushed to the side and not really focused on because in the end, you just want to see Kong and Godzilla fight each other. Now let's talk about the monsters, particularly with Godzilla. He's once again played by Haru Nakajima and the suit this time is brought back to being a lot more bulky a little more bulky than it was in the original movie, but I imagine it's still made out of a lighter material just because he's fighting King Kong this time around. So that requires a lot of physical movement. And this is actually one of my more favorite Godzilla designs. It mainly has to do with the head. Whenever you see Godzilla in profile, he looks amazing. There's just something so cool about this look of Godzilla. However, I will say that if you look at him straight on, especially when his mouth is open, he doesn't look that good. There's just something about his mouth when you look at him straight on that looks so unappealing. I think because his mouth is so big that it just looks a little off and cartoony. Some might argue that that plays into the film's comedic tone, which may be since the monsters do look a little more comedic this time around, but it's still something I'm not a big fan of. Now, unfortunately, I wish I could give the same level of praise for the look of King Kong this time around. While there's not really much to say about the body because it's an ape body, the head looks atrocious. When I reviewed King Kong Escapes two years ago, I mentioned that I preferred the suit in that movie because it was goofy, but at least the eyes moved, at least it had facial expressions. This Kong looks so deadpan. If I were to describe how this King Kong head looks, imagine if it was transported across the Toho lot, but the head fell off the suit and got run over by trucks, carts, it just got run over about six times and they didn't really have the money to try to fix it, so they did the best they could and ultimately that's why Kong's head looks as terrible as it does. It is just not a good look for Kong. And also that hand puppet really doesn't help things either. It's just awful and that's one reason why I'm excited for the new crossover because we're gonna have an awesome looking King Kong. The fight scenes are just entertaining all around and yeah it's because King Kong and Godzilla are fighting each other so that's just a holy shit moment. But I really like how they decided to beef up King Kong because the original King Kong's obviously really small when you compare him to Godzilla. So it wouldn't be a fair fight if it was a realistic, I mean, realistic King Kong versus Godzilla. So they beefed him up to Godzilla's size and he manages to hold his own in the fight even though there are more points where Godzilla kicks his ass than Kong kicks Godzilla's ass. One of the more entertaining special effects sequences is actually a sequence where Kong fights a giant octopus. For some reason, and this is just an excuse to introduce Kong, there's a giant octopus that comes to the shore of Faroe Island and attacks the natives. The octopus is created through the effects of stop motion with the tentacle, a fake octopus that Kong has to pick up and throw on the ground, and a real octopus. And this is actually a pretty fun sequence, and it just makes you wonder, mainly with the scenes with the real octopus, how did they do it? So when they actually had to film the scenes with the real octopus, there were four of them, and apparently they just had to blow dry the octopus to get it to move around a lot. It's pretty incredible, and the sound effects it makes is just really creepy. So with the octopus, I mentioned there were four of them. Three of them were released in the wild. The fourth one became Eiji Tsuburaya's dinner. So that's pretty... That's a neat bit of trivia right there. I just want to know what the process was for figuring out which octopus he was going to eat. Like, okay, you three, you're going back in the ocean. You, get in my mouth. And I also really love how Kong Skull Island pretty much recreated this exact scene. Further proof that that movie is pretty much a Kong movie that Toho would have made in this day if they had the money. The score by Akira Ifakube is great. This is the first movie where we actually get to hear the official Godzilla theme. Dun, 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 dun. 
at least if you're in Japan. But the score is great. There's some great memorable themes to it. And Ikiri Fukube definitely leaves his mark as the ultimate go-to guy when it comes to Godzilla scores, much like John Williams is with Star Wars. So I've been flopping around back and forth between the good and the bad. One other big problem I have with the movie, and this is just kind of more like that it was just the way things were back then. The natives are kind of a little racist. It's just the fact that it's Japanese actors in blackface. Because they obviously wanted to try to bring in moments from the original King Kong, like the island natives, I don't think they really thought this out through all the way. Because at least with King Kong, as racist as that movie can be at points, they actually got black people to play the natives. Like I mentioned, it's Japanese people in blackface, and watching it again with an adult mindset, you're just like, ooh. This is something that could never, ever be done in this day and age. If you watched a modern movie with natives dressed in blackface, you would just look at it and go, hell no, that is one of the most offensive things ever. So to wrap things up with the Japanese version, is it the big ultimate monster mash that you imagine? Not really, but it is still very entertaining. While the Kong suit looks ugly, the Godzilla suit looks great, the fight scenes are entertaining as hell, it has some very good comedic moments here and there, and the score by Akira Fukube is so memorable. It's one of my favorite Godzilla movies, maybe on the lower angle because there are some problems with it, but it's a movie that's definitely worth seeing in your lifetime. Starting with King Kong vs. Godzilla, this is very much the tone that the rest of the Showa era would kind of replicate and sometimes go in a more goofier fashion. We'll get more to that as the series goes on, but this movie, one of my favorites. Now, much like with the original Godzilla and Godzilla Raids Again, this movie, when it came to its American version, was heavily re-edited. And before I get into that, I want to briefly go over why a King Kong vs. Godzilla movie exists so early. The reason is because this was actually an idea proposed by Willis O'Brien. It didn't have Godzilla, but the original idea that he came up with was to have King Kong fight a giant monster created by Dr. Frankenstein. Nobody really wanted to take this idea, but then Toho got their hands on it, replaced the Frankenstein monster with Godzilla because they wanted this movie to be a vehicle to bring Godzilla back. So that's why King Kong vs. Godzilla exists so early. It was one thing, and then Toho turned it into another thing. Now, when it came to the American version, it was distributed by Universal, and much like with Godzilla King of the Monsters and Gigantus the Fire Monster, this version was heavily re-edited from the Japanese version. But unlike those versions, you can't really find the Japanese version in the United States. It has not been released on any type of home video. Out of the first three American versions of the first three Godzilla movies, this one might actually be the one that annoys me the most. One reason is because you have this UN subplot. The movie opens up within New York City. You have this guy talking about how reliant the UN is, how they helped Chile in a natural disaster by sending planes full of relief supplies. But pretty much this giant congratulatory pat on the back of how great the UN is. But the UN was never a part of the original King Kong vs. Godzilla. So once both King Kong and Godzilla pop up, the UN doesn't do jack shit. It's like, oh, Chile? Yeah, you got a natural disaster, we'll send relief supplies to you. Oh, Japan? Two giant monsters showed up in your mainland and they're fighting each other and destroying the cities? Well, tough shit, you're on your own. All we're gonna do throughout the rest of the movie is just talk about the scientific natures of both King Kong and Godzilla and how they're mortal enemies and they're destined to destroy one another and how they can actually sense where they are in Japan which is total bullshit also, because when you look at the Japanese version of King Kong vs. Godzilla, King Kong was brought to Japan just to help an advertising agency. Godzilla just happened to break out of his iceberg at the exact same time, and it's only a coincidence that the two monsters actually fought each other. They were not drawn to each other by instinct, they were never mortal enemies, they've never even met each other beforehand. It's all a big coincidence that King Kong and Godzilla fought each other. And the movie doesn't really do a good job at translating the humor from the Japanese version. Part of the reason is because the dub actors don't really know how to do the great over-the-top noises and reactions that the Japanese actors did. So it's kind of a bummer in that sense. And because the UN subplot is played a little more seriously, 
the tone with this version is all over the place. One of the things that really bugged me about this movie beforehand, one of the things that for me personally made it unwatchable, was the fact that Ikuri Fukube's score was replaced by stock music. Given that this is a universal movie, the American version used music from The Wolfman and The Creature from the Black Lagoon, so pretty much two of Universal's most iconic horror movies. Which those are good scores themselves and for the movies that they were from, but you're replacing an Akira Ifakube score. It's criminal to replace a score that great with something like this. Just imagine if you watched the original Star Wars trilogy, but instead of hearing John Williams' music, you heard the Hans Zimmer scores from the Dark Knight trilogy, which hey, those are great scores for the Dark Knight trilogy, but they don't fit well with Star Wars. Just like the music for the Wolfman and Creature from the Black Lagoon does not fit the tone of King Kong vs. Godzilla, and because of that, the official Godzilla theme that was introduced in this movie would not be heard in the United States until tomorrow's movie, Mothra vs. Godzilla. And then there are some other themes in this movie that American audiences just didn't hear, like the giant octopus theme, the King Kong theme, the plan to transport King Kong music. That's one of my favorite tracks on the soundtrack. So it was just downright criminal to replace Akira Ifakube's score. Now, watching this movie from an adult perspective, there is another little part in the movie that really just irks me to no end. So after Godzilla breaks free from his iceberg, the defense minister of Japan is getting asked all these questions on what to do with Godzilla. In the Japanese version, he's asked, are you sure Godzilla will return to Japan? And he just says, I'm sure of it because no creature forgets where it's born. In the American version, the Japanese press asked the defense minister, have you considered using the atom bomb? And the defense minister goes, possibly as a last resort. And I was watching the American version with my brother, and both at the same time we said, said no Japanese person ever. By inserting that line of dialogue into the American version, you completely have a misunderstanding of what Godzilla represents to begin with. He's a walking nuclear bomb. He was a monster created by atomic energy. What good is a fucking nuclear bomb gonna do against Godzilla? Nothing! It's just so goddamn stupid. The Japanese are the only nation that was ever hit by a nuclear bomb, so you can kind of see why adding in these lines of dialogue into the American version is insulting. Now the last major change I want to talk about with the American version is actually a change that doesn't exist. When King Kong vs. Godzilla came out in 1963 in America, there was a magazine that started this rumor with no kind of proof whatsoever that there were two different endings. If you watch this movie in America, King Kong wins, but if you watch this movie in Japan, Godzilla wins. So again, this magazine had no proof at all. It was just something that they pulled out of their ass. It could very well be the very first clickbait article out there, but somehow everyone believed it, including this person right here. Because when I was growing up and I was getting into these movies, I heard about this dual ending myth, and this was just on the edge of the internet being as prominent as it is today. So I looked in books, I was just so fascinated by the fact that they actually made two endings to this movie. I wish I could find the Japanese version somewhere. So once the internet came around and once I got to actually see the Japanese version for myself, that dual ending ended up being horseshit. Even back then, in 1963, it was horseshit. Because Toho had an official statement that King Kong was the winner. The reason for this is because King Kong was still more popular than Godzilla was, and at this point in the Godzilla series, he was still very much the bad guy. He had not turned to being a good guy just yet. The differences between the endings to both versions is actually so minimal that it's not really worth mentioning. But one thing that is worth mentioning is that Tomiyuki Tanaka, the producer, actually decided to retroactively change the ending in a book that he wrote. While Toho's original statement was that King Kong won, he decided to change it to where the two monsters fought and it was pretty much a draw. King Kong fought the giant octopus and won, then King Kong fought Godzilla and it was a draw. So whether it was a draw, whether King Kong won, there was no proof at all that Godzilla won the fight. Which is one thing that I'm going to be really curious to see what they do in Godzilla vs. Kong. Because the director of Godzilla vs. Kong, Adam Wingard, said that there's going to be a clear winner. Will that be the case? I rather doubt it. But we'll see what happens when 2020 comes around. But back to the American version of the original King Kong vs. Godzilla, I don't recommend this at all. If this is the only kind of access that you have to this movie, and you want to see King Kong and Godzilla fight each other, it does have its fun moments here and there, because all the special effects scenes are 
pretty much intact from the Japanese version. And there is some tighter editing. Sometimes there are shots in the Japanese version that go on for a little too long, and the American version actually does a good job of shortening those shots to make the movie feel a little more fast paced. But I don't really recommend this. So I would personally, as a grade, tell you to not waste your money on this movie. If you can find the Japanese version of King Kong vs. Godzilla, I'd recommend seeing that instead. And if you can find it with subtitles, then that's even better. Hopefully one day the Japanese version of King Kong vs. Godzilla can be released in America, especially with Godzilla vs. Kong coming out in two years. So hopefully that day will come. But until then, I wouldn't really recommend seeing the American version of this movie. But the Japanese version, again, if you can find it, go for it. And that's my review for King Kong vs. Godzilla. The next movie that Kong would appear in is King Kong Escapes, which was a co-production between Toho and Rankin Bass. I've already reviewed this movie, so you can definitely check that out in my Toho Month series of reviews. And then after that, King Kong went back to the United States, starred in the Dino De Laurentiis remake from 1976, the awful sequel, King Kong Lives, then Peter Jackson remade King Kong in 2005, then we had Skull Island last year, which was a complete reboot of the Kong series and doesn't follow the plot of the original 1933 movie. And then as I mentioned over and over, 2020 is going to be the big rematch between Godzilla and Kong. I am so looking forward to that movie. Fingers crossed that's going to be awesome. As for Godzilla, the next movie that would feature Godzilla is the movie I'm going to be talking about tomorrow, Mothra vs. Godzilla. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this review. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on this movie, if and when you've seen it. And as always, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.